Our next speaker, he is Dr. Daniel Yosher, Professor and Chair of Neurosurgery at uh, Baylor College of Medicine. Medicine. He's going to be talking about cortical visual prosthetics, prospects and challenges. So please join me in welcoming Daniel. Thank you. Well, good morning and thanks to everyone for uh, their attendance and attention and uh, thank you to Raphael and the organizers of this uh, remarkable symposium. I think um, the mission of uh, the event, as I understand it, as well as the mission of Rice University in this building, the BRC building, really uh, is emblematic of, of, of the role that a university and a school of engineering and a, a, a house of learning with great humanities and philosophy department plays a critical role to the medical advances that we want to make in the largest medical center in the world that lies right across the street. And uh, I hope my talk today will inform some of those issues as I speak from the perspective of a physician, a practicing neurosurgeon, whose goal is to harness the uh, incredible power of advances in neurotechnology to the betterment of patients' lives. So the rationale for the development of a visual cortical prosthetic is, is, is very compelling. Uh, incurable blindness disables over a million people in the United States and many millions more across the world. In most cases of acquired blindness, the visual part of the brain and the back of the head is completely intact and functional and, and largely unused and lies there latent and available as a target for therapeutic interventions. And of course, the development of a visual prosthetic device that targets this unused and latently powerful area of the brain offers the potential for restoring uh, vision and quality of life to many of these blind patients who right now have no alternative options. Now, what are the challenges? Obviously, the broad challenge is we want to restore useful vision for blind patients. But what are the immediate challenges? And I think when you consider it from a broad university-type perspective, we have several challenges. One, we want to make major advances in human subjects, but of course we have to carefully operate within ethical constraints. Why do we emphasize human subjects? Obviously, human subjects offer experimental advantages. When you study visual percepts in a laboratory animal, in a non-human primate, while it's amazing what we can do in non-human primates, a monkey is not going to describe the richness of a visual experience, of a visual percept, in a way that a human subject can do in an effortless fashion. And of course, the other reason that's compelling that why we want to work in human subjects is human patients are the ultimate beneficiaries, and the devices as they develop must be targeted to benefit these patients. A second challenge is we want to develop technologies that allow us to better understand human visual cortex. No matter how advanced the engineering is, and our previous speaker showed a remarkable example of how advanced technology is becoming, in order for these devices to work effectively, we have to understand the underlying, the underlying neurobiology, in this case, of visual cortex. And technology can help us understand the brain. We can't stimulate the brain effectively and produce useful percepts if we don't understand how the brain processes visual information. And the third challenge in, in the near short term is to develop technologies not only that help us understand the brain better, but allow us to interface with human visual cortex better in a way that can produce useful visual percepts for patients. The technology must advance, and frankly, the technology is advancing and in many ways, it's outstripping our understanding of the neurobiology. The neuroscience, in, in a large sense, is lagging behind. Now, where does this field begin? Uh, the figure uh, in the top of the picture there should be familiar to many of you in the room. That's Wilder Penfield, the Canadian neurosurgeon trained in the United States, who really first explored electrical stimulation of the cerebral cortex in awake, behaving human patients in a systematic way. And he's, of course, most famous for this drawing here of the homunculus, the uh, somatotopic representation of motor and sensory cortex. But he also did studies in visual cortex, in the back part of the brain here, in the occipital lobe right here. And what Penfield found when he stimulated the back of the brain, 
with a low level of current, too low to produce a seizure, but high enough to exceed the threshold for activation, the patients convincingly, reliably reported experiencing the sensation of seeing percepts of spots of light. And these were named phosphenes, these spots of light, shimmering points of light when you simulate a point in the brain. And if you stimulated the right occipital lobe, the spot of light was always in the left visual field. This understanding of the mapping of visual cortex has uh, advanced immeasurably over the intervening decades. And I'll show you one example of an experiment that illustrates this point nicely. On the back of our brain, in our visual part of the brain, there actually is a map of the visual world. And that map is really relatively ver veridical and true. There's a spot in the right occipital lobe that represents a spot in the left visual field. These correspondence are true and reliable. And this is a famous experiment done in 1988, you can never do this now, where uh, the uh, scientists took a, a, a monkey and actually pharmacologically paralyzed it and had it basically force its gaze to be fixed on this visual image of this grating. And you can see they sacrificed the animal after injecting a radio-labeled tracer. And there's actually a really remarkably veridical representation, point for point, of the grating. It's tattooed on the brain. And that illustrates really remarkably, there is a real map in our visual brain that represents the visual world. And here, flash forward decades later, this is a paper that we published uh, last year that shows that we can actually, based on this map and our understanding of this map, we can predict very accurately using a very simple mathematical model when we stimulate a given point in the brain with a given amount of current using a given size of electrode, we can predict very reliably where that phosphine, where that percept will be in visual field, how large it'll be, and what its location and extent is. So we have a pretty good understanding of the map in the visual brain, and we can stimulate individual spots in the brain and reliably and predictably produce individual spots of light, percepts of spots of light. So what does this mean? Well, the concept has been considered for decades. We can use these phosphenes, these percepts of spots of light, as combinatorial elements, as pixels, and basically deconstruct an image that would be captured by a camera into a series of either relatively high resolution or lower resolution collections of phosphenes that could be perceived as useful visual images. Um, very exciting, and this has tantalized science scientists for decades. And this is a sort of a view of what a visual cortical device would look like. And you have you know, an image captured by a camera built into a pair of glasses that is then deconstructed by a computer embedded in the skull and turned into a pattern of stimulation on that very readily mapped part of the brain that represents the visual world in the back of the head to produce an image corresponding to what's captured by the camera and restore vision to a patient who's blind. That's the dream, that's the goal. And there have been pretty impressive attempts to achieve this goal, particularly in the 60s and 70s and 80s and a little bit into the 90s. This is, uh, was ahead of its time. This was in England in the late 1960s and you can see the size and pedigree of the, of the computer processors. Obviously, we've exceeded this ability, but this patient was able to see some individual spots of light with this device. Yet, the development of prosthetics has been latent visual prosthetics for quite a while. And if you look at the time period of the attempts in the 60s going into the 90s, we've had nothing happening for over two decades, basically, in this field, even though there have been an really impressive corresponding advances in general technology, as you can see for the iPhone circa 2010, now seems ancient, of course. Um, so for a while, this field lay dormant, and it's probably because the early results with the attempts at visual prosthetics were unsuccessful in producing useful percepts, and the technology was too much in its infancy, too many wires, too many risks, too, too lacking in efficacy to make this really a useful, viable technology. But that's changed recently. And now, in 2018, there are actually four groups that I know of around the world that are actively developing a visual cortical prosthetic for clinical trial. One is the group in Australia, the Monash group, the group in Illinois, uh, 
of a group uh, based at Columbia and uh, our team here at Baylor in Houston is the clinical uh, partner for this group. And we're also the clinical partner along with UCLA for the effort by Second Sight. So these four groups all have devices in development for implantation. Second Sight's device is being developed as we speak. Uh, this is a view of what the, their device looks like, and it's obviously an early iteration. They're just 65 electrodes. The device is implanted in the visual cortex in the back of the brain, and the microprocessor is embedded into the skull, and the camera located in the glasses is actually allowed to wirelessly transmit information to the microprocessor where it's converted into a pattern of stimulation. And just to show you how real it is, this is a picture from a few days ago of a subject that I implanted. This is across the street. This is maybe a tenth of a mile from where we're standing right now. Uh, the patient undergoing the initial round of testing with this device implanted in a blind patient. So this is no longer science fiction, it's happening. The question is, how successful is it? How successful can we make it? And that's gonna be critically important. Now, I will bring up an area of great concern in the field, and that is the whole concept of developing these visual prosthetics to work in early visual cortex is contingent upon the notion that we can use phosphenes, these artificially produced spots of light that are geographically precise, that we can use them as combinatorial elements. But there's relatively little evidence that that is going to work very well. And that's a real problem in this field. That is a great challenge. Here's an example. This is the famous work of Dobell. Dobell was a leader, William Dobell, was a leader in this field, a very controversial figure who implanted his device both in New York City when he was at Columbia University and later moved his base of uh, operations to Portugal, I think one step, ahead, one step ahead of the law was kind of the approach. Um, but anyway, um, he was a visionary and he was ambitious and he published a paper in Nature of his best objective result. And that was he was able to take a subject and use, these are the different phosphenes produced from the 60 odd electrodes that he implanted in the patient's occipital lobe. And the patient was able to use these patterns of phosphenes as a form of visual braille. He could read braille faster by inputting the phosphenes into his brain than he could by inputting the sensory information to the fingertips. But I will caution, this is a long way away from creating useful visual forms. The patient was able to encode a pattern of phosphenes and learn it as an association to 26 letters in the alphabet. This is not the goal. We want patients to be able to capture a visual stimulus with a camera and effortlessly have that information encoded into a visual form that corresponds to that endless array of possibilities in the visual world. So what concerns me and others in the field is we have not succeeded yet in really using phosphenes and combinatorial elements. And a lot of my research over the past decade has been studying this concept in epilepsy patients who are undergoing clinical monitoring with these electrodes in the brain. And what we do is we use the space between clinical electrodes, and this cartoon shows how we do this, and we put mini electrodes, we call them research hybrid electrodes, in that space and we implant these on visual cortex and we can use these electrodes to record and stimulate Remember, these subjects are not blind. They're in the hospital because they have epilepsy and that's the reason they're undergoing these implantations, but they volunteer for additional studies while they're waiting to have seizures in the hospital as part of their clinical evaluation. And when we have tried multi-electrode stimulation, basically using phosphenes as combinatorial elements, and here's the paradigm, use the phosphenes, map them out, and create letters out of different patterns of phosphenes and see if the subjects can perform accurate detection of these percepts. We find that it actually is very challenging. These phosphenes are not readily integrated as combinatorial elements. It's difficult for the subjects to draw the multiple phosphenes at the same time. There are attentional mechanisms at play. This is an unnatural form of activation of early visual cortex. And what will answer this problem? Well, one possibility is 
that the arrays we're using to go back to the array, we're talking about 24 electrodes. And even the array that we're using with that Orion device that we've implanted in the blind subject is just 65 electrodes. Maybe the answer to creating useful combinatorial elements is to have a million electrodes where we have much tighter pitch, much higher resolution, and we can really create useful forms if we have a million electrodes. And this is one tactic that we're involved with. And I'm partnering here with Ken Shepard from Columbia Engineering uh, with funding from DARPA. And we are in the process of developing a 1 million electrode array, beginning with a 65,000 electrode array. But obviously, these are orders of magnitude above what we're using now. This may be the answer. On the other hand, though, the other possibility that is a concern is no matter how many electrodes you have in V1, in order to bring this information and translate it into useful visual forms, activation of V1 must be carried downstream in the complex hierarchy of visual cortex. And when I told you before about the map in the back of the brain that is the early site of visual information being input into the cortex, I didn't tell you that there are another 30 visual areas at least. And you can see the complex interconnections between these visual areas. So when we activate, when my retina is being activated by the images of all these handsome people in the room, that is a very different form of activation, the photic activation of my retina that results in activation of a precise array of millions, tens of millions, perhaps hundreds of millions of visual neurons in early visual cortex, which then gets carried downstream to higher areas that are specialized for form or motion or color, all the higher properties that are necessary for us to have a rich visual experience. It may be that even one million electrodes in early visual cortex, if you don't turn on the neurons in a useful, interpretable way, no, you could have a billion electrodes and it may not work. So this is one of the challenges. Understanding the neurobiology of how we activate early visual cortex to make it translate into useful images that are propagated through the stream of processing and the hierarchy of vision. This, uh, how am I doing on time here? I just want to make sure before I go on a, too much of a tangent. Um, not to go too far afield, but we've looked at this in stimulating the brain in our sighted subjects. When we stimulate using simple stimulation, early visual cortex, that area I showed you with the map in the back of the head and the occipital lobe, it's very easy for us to get a subject to see a spot of light, to see a phosphine. But when we stimulate later areas in visual cortex, they usually see nothing. Why is that? Because the later areas are more complicated. When we stimulate a patch of brain in the early part of visual cortex, where there's a relatively simple map and where the geographic localization of adjacent areas in the visual field are contiguous, this stimulation is relatively easily perceived by the subjects. They see a spot of light. But when we stimulate a later area in visual cortex, which have complex maps that encode different visual objects, that's a cacophony. That's like pounding on the piano and expecting to produce a symphony. It doesn't work. And when we stimulate the later areas of visual cortex, nothing enters visual perceptual consciousness. So this is really the challenge is when we use electrical stimulation, even in early visual cortex, are we doing it in a way that will engage the later areas in a useful, meaningful way that will produce useful visual percepts? And this map, again, I show you one more time to highlight the importance of that challenge. Visual cortex is very complicated. And it is unclear that our current strategy of banging on the piano is going to work well enough to produce concerts. And obviously, concerts are the long-term goal. And I'm optimistic about this field in the coming decades. But I think we have to approach this in a rigorous way that really emphasizes an understanding on visual neuroscience. So one experiments, set of experiments that we've been doing lately in our lab is trying a different way of stimulating a brain, particularly given the limitations. We don't have a million electrodes yet. We have 65 electrodes at most. So what we've been doing recently is sort of inspired by Helen Keller and Ann Sullivan. Instead of stimulating all the points 
at one time to try to produce an image like voxels on a screen. We're stimulating dynamically. Imagine instead of pounding on your palm of your hand to produce the letter Z all at one time, tracing the letter in temporal sequence on your hand. It's actually much easier to perceive, and we've been doing that in visual cortex as an alternative way to get more information and also to get information in spots in between electrodes, creating virtual electrodes and trying to blur the points together into a coherent form. And this has been very promising. So here's an example of a patient that we recently uh, studied this using our uh, custom uh, electrode array, and our goal here was to take a series of phosphenes, select out the phosphenes in their spatial location that can produce an approximation of a letter, and then stimulate and see what the subjects will perceive. And when we do this, it actually works remarkably well with no training. Remember, I told you when we stimulated all the spots all at once, the subjects never were really able to perceive a coherent form of a letter. But when we stimulated them dynamically, and here is the estimate using our model of what the subjects should see with stimulation of this precise sequence of electrodes in visual cortex. We're predicting a shape like this. And here's what the subject, I'm sorry, actually saw. This is a sighted epilepsy subject. So for that, us, that was extraordinary. After spending months trying to get this to work with concurrent multi-electrode stimulation with no success, this would happen on the first try with no training virtually every time. So this really was exciting for us. And we've actually tried this in a blind subject. We haven't yet tried this in the Orion subjects, the subjects that we're implanting with a commercially approved device. This was an experimental blind subject. We had a limited number of electrodes. And our goal, for example, was to create an upside down U with this type of stimulation. And here you see the subject. And she's, she's blind, so she's using her finger to maintain her gaze in the center of the screen. And you see that's what she drew. Very, very reliably according to what we predict. And of course we did a complicated set of psychophysical experiments. Once we saw this was working, we wanted to prove that it worked. And of course, the patient's performance uh, <coughs> far exceeded anything close to chance. And really, uh, uh, we're able to reliably do this with essentially no training. So there is hope that using novel methods of engaging early visual cortex, we can get information downstream into the higher areas of cortical processing. So to conclude, I'll raise a few final points, challenges. So there's no question that a new generation of technologically advanced visual cortical prosthetic devices are emerging and they're being tested now. An important concern to recognize is phosphenes are not pixels and it's gonna take strategic methods and a clear and enhanced and better understanding of visual neuroscience to make this work. Will more electrodes be a game changer? As we march towards a million electrodes, we will find out. The role of novel stimulation paradigms will be important. I think this is a really important point. We've done very few experiments where we've been able to train subjects over weeks and weeks and months and months. When we deal with epilepsy subjects, we only have about a week to work with them due to the ethical constraints. So I think this uh, is very important to, to study these patients in the long term. The key will be using electrical stimulation of early visual areas to engage those late stages of visual cortex that do the heavy lifting in our brain's work to understand visual information. And then last, I'll make this point, I think there will need to be a combination of testing in animal subjects and human subjects in the epilepsy monitoring unit and also clinical trials in blind patients to make progress in the coming uh, years. Uh, finally, I want to acknowledge our uh, team of uh, investigators and collaborators. I want to mention one other person who's not on this slide, um, and that is the late, great uh, Professor Baruch Brody. Uh, Baruch Brody was a professor at Rice University. He was the chairman of the Department of Philosophy here. He also ran the Center for Clinical Medical Ethics at Baylor College of Medicine, and uh, he passed away just this past year. And when I started doing these experiments, and I was 
challenged very appropriately about ethical concerns. Uh, one of the great things, smartest moves I ever made is I walked across the street to meet with the chairman of the Department of Philosophy, a world-class medical ethicist, uh, Professor Brody, and he immediately took control of the project from the ethics perspective, explored it in a rigorous way that only a world-class figure who was on the President's Council of Bioethics could do. And I will say that without the help of this great Rice University figure, I would have never been able to develop the program in the way that I have. So I'd like to acknowledge, in addition to my scientific collaborators, the work of this uh, you know, really spectacular medical ethicist and humanist and, and great individual uh, for helping project this work. And I think it exemplifies the importance not only of the engineering contribution that great universities like Rice can make to the hospital work and laboratory we do, work we do in the medical school, but also the ethics and humanistic influence that is critically important as well, I think follows the spirit of the DeLange Conference. Thanks to everyone for the opportunity to speak today. Wonderful. Fantastic talk, fantastic. So um, if anybody has any questions, please come up to the mic. Thank you for a very nice talk. Uh, could you give a little bit more comments on few uh, technologies, for example, like a second site or a Monash or IT, those technologies, for example, we're talking about second site, right? So they have those cameras, you know, sitting on the uh, eyeglass, <clears throat> and then, you know, coupling into the uh, visual cortex and the either subretina or epiretina. So can you talk about the challenges? For example, have the wires come out? Is there are medical concerns out there? Well, I, I want to make it clear, I'm not the engineer here. So um, in this room, I'm probably the least expert to answer detailed engineering questions. But I think you're asking me how, how it works. I, I mean, the device, the stimulation you're asking, or how the, the algorithms that translate it into a pattern of stimulation? What, what are the, uh, the medical challenges? Medical challenges. The medical challenges are, are actually not that bad. And there's an, at least one other neurosurgeon in the room I see, I think will agree. We can implant the device quite safely into visual cortex. I don't think there's gonna be adverse consequences. Uh, I think the biggest medical challenge is actually, there is one challenge. When you look at visual cortex, I didn't show you this, but this dashed line here represents the calcarin fissure. And much of the visual cortex, that map I showed you, is actually buried in that fissure. So when we implant the electrodes, we're able to implant it on the surface here, but we can't really safely get inside that fissure. So we can't capture all of V1. I think that is a medical challenge. The way we get around that is adjacent to the stripes on either side of this dashed line, which we call V1, the early visual area, is a secondary visual area called V2, which has that representation. So we can probably get away without going inside that fissure. But medically, it would be dangerous to go inside that fissure. It probably would be destructive. I think that's probably the main surgical limitation. Obviously, a big issue here is, is implanting electrodes right on the surface the best strategy? Are we better off using microelectrodes that penetrate the brain? I think in the long term, we will advance to using microelectrodes because thresholds for stimulation are lower. You can stimulate more electrodes. But right now, I think from an ethics perspective, as well as a proof of concept perspective, I think Second Sight and the other groups that are taking that cortical surface strategy, I think it is a better strategy right now. All right. Thanks a lot, Dr. Yosher. That was really interesting. Um, so there's pretty compelling evidence from uh, congenitally blind individuals, but also people who acquire blindness later, that even though that primary visual cortex is intact, it's not like it's not sitting around doing nothing. It adopts different functions. It takes on auditory processing functions. It takes on language processing functions. And so are there some costs to doing this sort of rudimentary visual a processing? Excellent question. And, and in the interest of simplicity, I was trying to make a point, but you're absolutely right that there's abundant evidence, mostly from fMRI studies. And we've done careful fMRI studies with my collaborator, Michael Beauchamp, on every one of these subjects using language tasks and imagery tasks to see if we are engaging early visual cortex. I think it's probably true that that's 
very much the case in patients with congenital or early acquired blindness. I think it's less the case for more recent blindness. I think if you're worried about cost, I think that's another argument to say, until we understand this better, let's focus on surface electrodes. And that's one of the things that helps me sleep well at night and helps me you know, adhere to the spirit of Professor Brody is that we are not damaging the brain to do this. Uh, so I don't think there is a cost in the approach we are taking and Second Sight is taking and DARPA is taking. I think there is potentially a small cost if you are making intracortical penetrations. But even that, there's a lot of evidence that with the proper use of intracortical devices with small penetrating microwires, the costs are very limited there as well. So I think, we're, I think we're being fair to the patients, and we certainly describe this to the patients. I think just to summarize, uh, this gentleman's point is that in blind patients, it's probably unfair to say that that area of the brain is doing nothing. It's certainly doing less and less than what it was originally wired for in acquired blindness, but there is some evidence that it picks up new functionality as patients translate from a sighted existence to a blind existence. So I think that's a fair question. Great talk, Dan. It's really exciting to see how much progress has been made in this field. You know, the, the, the devices have been in development for many decades, but it's only recently that they've made the transition into humans and we're learning a lot very quickly. So uh, congrats on that. My question has to do with the, the learning effects, because you mentioned several times uh, you know, you gave many examples that showed performance, you know, with, with zero training or with no training, and that was a, a highlight that you made. But I'm curious as to how much better these participants get with experience, because, you know, you're giving them a sensory experience that they've never had before, mm -hmm. and they, you know, you, you can imagine how important the learning would be. And I'm I think curious it's to know one of the areas I'm most excited about. I can't study learning in a rigorous way in a subject that I have for a couple of days in the epilepsy monitoring unit. There's beautiful work by, by my mentor, John Mansell, the, the visual neuroscientist, where he's shown that if you take a microelectrode and you implant it in a monkey's visual cortex and you train the monkey to detect that stimulation, we assume the monkey is seeing a phosphine. We don't know, but that's the assumption. The monkey gets better and better at detecting artificial activation of visual cortex. But if you take that same site and you put a, so you have an electrode on the site, the monkey's gotten better and better at detecting electrical activation. Then you put a visual image, a spot of light, a real natural spot of light on the screen corresponding to that part of the brain, they are less good at detecting natural visual stimuli as they get better at detecting artificial visual stimuli. Mm -hmm. Then, if you stop stimulating their brains electrically and retrain them to use that part of the brain to detect natural stimuli, they get better, again, at detecting natural visual stimuli. So there is clear changes, ability to, in, to train functionality in a way that we don't really understand that is potentially very powerful. I don't know the answer. I think it's one of the most exciting parts of this field, and I think we'll only see answers to those questions when we implant blind subjects. With all the ethical caveats that are there, and they're very real and they're very important, the only way we're going to understand the role of training is in blind subjects. Well, it sounds like you've opened that door, so good luck. Thank you for a wonderful talk. In terms of dynamic current steering for pattern recognition and the discovery that if the person engages their motor or sensory motor cortex, there's greater pattern recognition. As part of the phosphine problem, mm -hmm. that vision is, is a whole brain product and other parts of the brain are contributing to that. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, 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 I I don't totally understand the effect, but there's a lot more going on than simply engaging V1. There is no question of that. When my wife asks me to get something out of the refrigerator and I can't find it, it is frequently in the center of my visual field. <laughs> attention, <laughs> visual attention is a huge element. And, and frankly, when we, natural vision, I'm hardly using the rods and cones that represent my peripheral vision. We foveate and we attend to elements in the visual scene. And that's what natural vision is about. You're absolutely right. Okay, one, Super complicated. One last question for you from Chris Salthouse at Draper. 
Um, has a consensus emerged for occipital or retinal visual implants? Uh, that's a, that's a, the answer, simple answer is no. Mm -hmm. The uh, retina is an attractive target in that it nicely matches the, the, the profound success in the cochlear implant world to use the sensor, sensory organ as opposed to using cort cortex, going closer to the entry into the circuit. But the retina is a challenging, it's very small, it's very sensitive, and there's been some progress with second sight using retinal arrays, but in some ways visual cortex is more attractive. V1 is the size of a credit card in the human brain. It's a big, relatively robust target, and I think the plasticity issues are more likely to be prevalent working in cortex, so that's what makes cortex an attractive target, but absolutely retina is in the game and, and there are retinal stimulation advocates who have very good ground to stand on. I think these two fields will develop in parallel and in a synergistic way. Okay, okay thank you. All right, thank you.